You uh, have a documentary. Uh, you are a documentary filmmaker. You're a paranormal investigator. Uh, and your latest uh, work is uh, Shock Docs on Discovery Plus, and it's uh, Scream, the True Story. Now, I am a fan of the Scream movies, but I guess not that much of a fan. I had no idea this stuff was based on actual events. Yes, it sure was. Uh, the, the original screenplay uh, for the movie Scream that, that started the entire franchise uh, was based on the true story of Danny Rowling, uh, also known as the Gainesville Ripper. Yeah, no, so Rowling, this was uh, 89, 90, around then. He killed uh, young women in Florida and a family in Louisiana, and he also had a very particular style of killing uh, in, in one case, he would, or in all the cases, he would somehow pose the bodies in certain ways, right? Yes, yeah, and, and where that you know that parallel really comes in the movie Scream. I mean, yeah. you know, yes, Danny did wear a mask. Uh, he did use a knife, but you know, kind of even beyond that, uh, when he was targeting Gainesville, Florida, he was he was going after college aged women. Uh, Gainesville is a huge university town, and when these bodies were being discovered, there was no suspect. Uh, there was no description. There was no vehicle that nobody knew anything. So there was this overwhelming sense of paranoia amongst this uh, young university uh, student body of who could the killer be? Uh, is it a fellow student? Uh, people thought maybe it's a professor. Uh, and then when you kind of think about, you take that and you look at the original scream, and you can totally see that premise there. Yeah, because I was going to ask, and now I want to let people know that it's not an exact retelling of Rowling's story. Because Rolling Story is much more terrifying, obviously, because it's real. Uh, but it wasn't like movie fans, you know, getting too much into movies. He he had a pretty troubled past with it, especially with his father, right? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we we definitely cover uh, in Scream the True Story, the documentary. We cover uh, for those who don't know who Danny was, uh, what he did. Uh, Danny's personal story, uh, how he grew up, the abuse that he endured, um, all of these of these things. But then, of course, we we focus on the paranormal aspect right. of this, where uh, Danny had claimed to be under some form of demonic possession while committing these murders. Now, was that his main defense? Uh, was that it, he he claimed to be uh, uh, possessed by a demon, a demon that he named Gemini, right? Yeah, and not only was he claiming that, because, uh, you know, sometimes we see that when people like this are, are apprehended, these stories start to surface once they're caught, uh, which, you know, obviously law enforcement and, and the eyes of the public and the media would say this certainly seems like somebody to trying, uh, making an attempt to deflect responsibility. Um, and I'm not saying that he wasn't responsible, but one thing about uh, Danny Rowling, uh, he was making these claims well before he was caught, and how we know that is he was keeping journals, uh, an audio diary when he was hiding yes. from the police in the woods. Yeah. Uh, he made hundreds of these cassette tapes, just kind of ranting to himself, and uh, uh, like a diary, if you will, and claiming that this creature, this thing, would come to him at night. Uh, he had no control over it. Uh, couldn't remember what he had done at different times, and this is just what he was saying to himself. Now, you're also a paranormal investigator. You have a lot of experience with that. You work with a psychic medium. Her name is Cindy Kaza. Now, in the documentary, you go to his his childhood home, right? Where else do you go to try to find out more clues about this? Sure. Uh, we started in the town of Gainesville, um, you know, besides, you know, we conducting interviews with the prosecuting attorney, Danny's fiance, other individuals. But we started off by exploring and investigating uh, the campsite where Danny had been hiding out in the woods of Gainesville, uh, you know, plotting his, his deeds and, and recording all these cassettes and whatnot. We start there. We do some paranormal investigation. Uh, Cindy, the medium that I'm working with, uh, is there to try to tap into things. Um, as a result of what we experienced, what we caught, and the interviews, and, and all things considered, Rhodes led us back to his hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. And, of course, we wanted to visit his childhood home, see if we could interview the, the family living there. Uh, but to our surprise, because, you know, at first we didn't know if they would be willing to talk to us at right. all. 
And uh, not only was Sheila Jackson willing to uh, speak with us, she welcomed us into her house and told us that she and her family had been experiencing a, a physical and very terrifying haunting. They actually purchased the home uh, from the Rolling family, uh, which would be from Danny's oh, okay. father. Okay. That's how long she had been there. So one of the first questions I asked her after hearing all these you know, horrible things that were happening to them well, with physical attacks and, and you name it. I said, well, how long has this been going on? And she kind of paused and she said, well, um, you know, it started around Thanksgiving of 2006. Uh, and, and why that really gave me a chill down my spine is Danny was executed just a couple of weeks prior. And so to me, my mind kind of drew that parallel. Could this really be uh, the spirit of Danny returning home? Is that what is haunting this house? And, um, you know, that was my first thought. And my second thought is, my God, could you imagine uh, living in a home with this type of volatile uh, activity for that many years? And you said there was physical activity in this home, yes, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Sheila Jackson and her family were experiencing uh, being held down in their bed, uh, choked, uh, having their skin pinched, twisted, hair pulled, um, doors slamming, objects being thrown across oh, the room. Geez. Uh, night terrors, disembodied voices, just to name a few. Now, see, I, you know, two weeks in, I'm gone. Why would they stick around for that? That's definitely a question I asked. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, let me just even say, being in the house, I mean, you could feel even before we, you know, before my gear told me something was there, before my partner Cindy Kaza, with her mediumship, knowing something was there, you just knew. Uh, you had walked into the hornet's nest, for lack of a better word, and I asked her, you know, why, why, why not just move at, at any cost? You know, why not leave? And she, she just kind of looked at me and said, well, um, we were able to buy this house uh, very cheap. We never thought we could be homeowners, right. um, and probably because of its notorious past is why they got it mm -hmm. so cheap. And right. um, she just said, we can't afford to move, right. you know, and yeah. she was hoping that her... Um, you know that her faith, while well, she's you know very religious, you can see uh, if you watch the documentary, there's items all over the walls, and she just kind of thought, you know, this this is our place, and this is what we have, and uh, this is you know they're kind of landlocked. So when you said you could feel it, like what are you feeling? Can you describe what you? I mean, I know you've gone through this. You have gear, you said too, but what are when well, you said when yeah. you walked in, you could feel it? What what are you feeling? Uh, sure, in, in that. Uh, exact case, you could feel a very foreboding sense. Um, you felt that you weren't alone, uh, to be more specific. You could feel kind of a staticky charge, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the house, even during the day when she gave me the tour, uh, it was daylight. There was, you know, there were windows open, blinds open, but the house seemed abnormally dark. It seemed deafen deafening quiet, kind of just, just a very strange sense as we walked around the different rooms uh i myself felt that something was kind of walking along with us you just kind of felt like there was something just clinging uh, on your every step almost kind of tracing you um you could see the effect that it had taken on her uh you could see how wore out uh sheila was uh describing these things um kind of all of it together just left a really negative feeling in you now this you're you're talking about this could be Danny Rowling's spirit, right? Not the demon that supposedly possessed him. Well, that's the thing. That's I guess that would be the million dollar question. You know, there were times where we thought we were making contact with Danny based on the responses we were getting or the voices that we were capturing. And then of course I'm relying on my partner Cindy Kaza. She's a world renowned psychic medium. She's been you know, a veteran in this field. And uh it was amazing because I've worked with Cindy um quite a bit at this point, um, hundreds of hours in the field, and I've never seen her this particular way. Uh and she would say over and over uh, this is the most manipulating spirit she had ever dealt with. Uh, there were times where she was sure it was Danny, and then there were times where she was unsure and she felt that she had tapped into something much darker. And so we wonder, you know, could Danny have been there as well as whatever this dark force was that was compelling him to, or influencing him, or was it something evil in general? Because a lot of times evil entities, uh, you know, They've been around way longer than, than humans, uh, true demonic spirits. They know how to mess with you. Uh, they, can, they can speak in different voices. It's, it's hard to say. You know, at the end of the day, we still wonder, uh, was it both or was it one? Okay, so I'm going to refer to another horror movie, 
and that's the I believe it was the Conjuring where they were able to prove some kind of de- demonic possession. This is also based on a true story, and that cleared someone of a murder. Now, what if somehow, and I don't know if there's any chance that you convince some judge or something that there is a demon here that's or some kind of spirit in this house that maybe caused Danny Rowling to do that. Would that then clear him of the, I mean, he, he took part in these murders, but would it somehow clear him or anything like that? Is there any chance of something like that happening? No, no, not at all. Uh, there's, there's no way uh, to a judicial system you could prove uh, responsibility due to demonic possession. Um, and, you know, and, and I've been asked, you know, do I truly think Danny committed these homicides because he was possessed? Is that the definitive answer? I can't, I still can't make that, um, I can't discern that. I, but, what, but what I do believe is that he believed wholeheartedly that he was under some type of demonic influence. We know that he meets a lot of the serial killer criteria, uh, trauma, severe child abuse, mm-hmm. horrible upbringing, exhibited traits as a young child, such as hurting small animals, voyeurism, and other things that escalated, obviously, to the, the gruesomeness that is the Gainesville Ripper. But I also believe, and let me just kind of pose this, I, you know, just like energy attracts energy, right? You know, if you're positive, positivity is going to come to you, and, mm-hmm. and then the other side of the coin. If Danny really believed he was influenced by evil, and he was committing these horrible crimes in a sense to appease evil, that alone certainly would conjure evil, you know? And right. so, um, unfortunately, it's just a very twisted paradox um but you know we we did set out to see if there if there was paranormal activity at these locations and we can certainly attest that there was and people will see that uh throughout the journey of scream the true story we're uh, talking with steve shippy paranormal investigator documentary filmmaker uh shock docs scream the true story streaming on discovery plus right now um you mentioned gear so with the couple minutes we have left i'm just curious because all I know about paranormal technical gear is what I've learned from the Ghostbusters movies. Is it anything? Are you dealing with anything like that? Is there some kind of weird ray involved, ectoplasm? I mean, what, what kind of gear are we talking about here? Yeah, sure. So I guess some of the most simplest forms would be a digital recorder. Uh, you know, you, you hit record, uh, you go oh, okay. to, to the location, and you ask questions. Are you here? Uh, who is here? Why are you doing this? You, you ask all the questions you want to ask, and then you play back and you listen for any kind of disembodied voice response. Uh, we use motion sensors, K2 meters, which will pick up uh, electromagnetic field energy. We believe uh, that spirits are energy. So a lot of times when some Something does approach, uh, or, or it, maybe if you see or hear something and you move toward that sound, you start getting these random, uh, bizarre fluctuations of electromagnetic field with no ambient source to provide that. That, to me, would be considered something anomalous. Uh, then we have full-spectrum cameras, night vision, you know, which would be infrared, uh, sometimes even just classic photography, snapping pictures in the directions of sound. Um, or if your gear is alerting something is there, you snap pictures in that way, then you examine the photos later. Uh, there's so many different devices, but those are probably some of the most classic. So we're not dealing with anything like Egon Spendler invented in Ghostbusters. There's a, these are all pretty... I mean, you're talking about some pretty basic things, and, and you're just trying to get some physical evidence you can. Do you use things to lure the spirits? Do you, like, I, I don't know if there's, like, some people say when you smoke a cigar, like, that brings spirits about, or when you light a candle, or, or is there some kind of Ouija board type of thing involved? Yeah, well, and essentially what we do sometimes is trigger objects. You know, if we if we are told that it's the spirit of a child haunting this place and the family has seen a child and and that's the consensus of everybody who's witnessed something, you know, we, we try, and, and sometimes they have a clue as to, well, you know, this child died in this house in 1876. Maybe we'll find a toy from that era, um, or if it's maybe perhaps Grandpa uh, Joe, per se, that, uh, used to do this for a living, or this was his hobby. Uh, we we find an item and kind of lay it out, and then put our gear around that. So we call that trigger o- objects, and certainly we do use those from time to time. Hmm, that's fascinating. All right, this is uh, Steve Shippy. the uh, The documentary is Shock Docs: Scream, the True Story. If you are a fan of the Scream movies, this uh, this case of Danny Rowling uh, was the inspiration 
for for those movies. And uh, Steve, thank you very much. It's streaming now on Discovery Plus. So, Steve, thank you for your time and and uh, and good luck. And we're looking forward to watching this. Hey, thank you for having me.